Hi, Jeff Geisinger here, and welcome to the second video in our Diva 4.0 tutorial series. In today's tutorial, we'll be looking at the sunpath diagram. And so we'll be visualizing the movement of the sun throughout the sky for a particular geographic location. And we'll also be able to visualize in real time some shadows cast by the sun at a given position, and we'll also bring in a range of shadows so that we can look at not only the shadows for one point in time, but rather a range of hours in a given day. Now this tool is incredibly useful for looking at the way that your building interacts with the sun. Whether you're looking at passive solar design potential or exploring different shading design options or trying to understand the way that your building overshadows other buildings or uh, neighboring sites, this tool is a great starting point for understanding the way that your building will interact with the sun. So you'll remember that in our last tutorial we looked at a point in time visualization for a scenario where we were visualizing the direct shading of our building. This model that we'll be using is basically the same file, but it has more simplified geometry. So I have a layer turned on called the massing model, which basically has a more simplified stacking of simple floor volumes that are based on our typical office. In the previous tutorial, we were using more detailed geometry in this daylight model layer group, which has seen objects like columns and floor slabs and, and glazing. This would be okay to use for this tutorial, but I'm going to be using the more simplified geometry instead because when we get to visualizing the real-time shadows, it, uh, the simpler the geometry, the smoother your panning and visualizing of those real-time shadows will be, although having more detailed geometry will still work. I also have a ground modeled in this file, and I'll go ahead and turn this off because with the sun path component, we'll be able to visualize shadows cast on our viewport without actually having to have any um, ground object modeled. So let's open up our Grasshopper canvas, and if we go to the Diva 4 components tab and we go to the panel on the right, you'll see that there is a component called the sun path here on the upper right. Now once I place that on the canvas, you'll notice that there is a change occurring in the Rhino viewport. The background is set to white and we have a shadow cast in the ground and then of course you'll also see that a sun path diagram pops up in the corner of our building at the origin point. Now this custom viewport is a function of the sun path component. It actually creates a custom display within the Rhino viewport. So if I right click on the perspective name and I scroll down you'll see that there is a new display type within this viewport called Diva Sun Path and that actually will is what enables the shadows to be cast inside our Rhino viewport automatically. So one of the first things that's important to set with the sun path component is the location. And you see that that's the first input here that we have in this sun path component. So you see that the location has a drop down parameter list and the preset is the Boston weather file. So we'll go ahead and, and since we were using that in the last tutorial, we'll, we'll be using that for throughout these tutorials. So we'll keep it here on Boston. Now you'll see that our sun path is automatically placed here on the origin of our Rhino file, but it's not quite centered on our building. So we'll have to set a new center point so that we can orient it properly and make sure that it is centered on our building and showing the sun moving around our building correctly. Now there are a few ways to set this point, and I'll go ahead and use a few simple grasshopper components to make that work. So I'll zoom out a little bit, and what I'll do is I'll use an area component in order to get the centroid of one of my volumes. The area component, you'll see that it has an output that is the area centroid of geometry. So if I right click on this G and I say set one geometry, I'll go ahead and just select any one of these volumes. I could set the, the top one here. And you'll see that there is a center point that is the centroid of that upper floor slab previewed in the Rhino viewport. Now I don't want to center my sun path on that point because it will bring the sun path up to the roof of my building. So what I'll do is I'll project that point onto the XY plane. And so to do that, I will bring in a component called the project component projects an object onto a plane. So by default, that plane is the world XY plane, and you see that it's previewed here. It's basically the ground plane, so that's perfect. I don't want to change that. And the geometry that I want to project is actually that point. So the point is 
located here in the centroid output of that area component, and I'll go ahead and plug that into the geometry input of the project component. So now my point is perfectly located at the base of my building at the very center of the floor plan. And then I can take that point, which is the projected geometry, this G output, and plug it into the point input of my sun path component. And it snaps that sun path right in the center of my building, which is what we wanted to do. And just to simplify our viewport, I'll go ahead and turn the preview off of these two components that I had added. So I'll select them, middle click, and say preview off. Now we can see that there's still a problem even though the sun path is nicely centered on our building, it's too small. And that brings us to the next input here on the sun path component, the radius input. So that will be the radius of our diagram and the default is 20. So you'll see that the units for our Rhino project is in meters and so the default value of 20 means 20 meters. And since our building is about 48 meters by 39 meters, the sun path diagram is too small. So what I'll do is create a number slider to manually scroll through a few different sizes to see if we can get it to the right size, probably about 100 meters or so in radius. So I'll type in number slider to bring it onto the canvas and I'll double click here and set that to integers. And I'll set my minimum to about 50 since our building is just about 50 and, and I'll set the maximum to 150 or so and press OK. So now I could input that slider into the radius input of the sun path component. And you see that it now snaps to a larger val uh, value, the radius of 50. And if I scroll through this radius, you see that our sun path is getting a little bit bigger and a little bit scaled more appropriately for the size of our example office building. 100 seems like it's about right. And you'll notice that there is a sun visualized in our sun path diagram. Now we can change the date of the sun by using the month, day, and hour inputs, just like we set the month, day, and hour for our point in time visualization in the last tutorial. So just like we did last time, I'll bring in a number slider for the month. I'll set it to integers and the minimum of one and then the maximum of 12 plug that into the month. I'll copy that and I will set the maximum for this one to 31 for the days. And I'll also make a copy and paste it again and set the maximum hour at 24. And then OK. And we won't get a sun when we have an hour where the sun is below the horizon as we had experienced last time, so I'll bring that back up to 13, 1 p.m. I'll go ahead and change the date to the same day that we used for the last simulation for the visualization direct shading analysis, and I will make the month too. So you see that we can scroll through different times of the year and hour, and that will affect the position of the sun as well as the location of the shadow. So let's take a closer look at the settings within the SunPath component to see a little bit more about the lines that are previewed in the Rhino viewport. So if I click on settings, on the settings button, you see that the location is set from the weather file. And I had already set that using the drop down parameter list. You can alternatively set the location from a specific latitude, longitude, and time zone if you don't have a, a weather file for your particular project but we'll, we'll be using this default for now. You see that there are a few different options and I'll go ahead and actually I'll turn off these options so that we can look at them one by one. I'll keep render ground plane and custom display in active viewport selected. So if I select show annual sun path arcs, you see that that brings in the sun path arcs for the first day of each month and they are shown in solid lines and in dashed lines to distinguish between different months that are adjacent to each other. So if I go ahead and preview the sun, show sun position, and let's say I move my day to the first day of the month, 
and I now scroll through the different months of the year, you'll see that the sun will lock to the position of the different sun paths, which represent the annual sun paths. Bring it back to two. Now if I turn that back off and I will indicate show annual sun path analemmas. Now the analemma is the curve that is representing the movement of the sun at one fixed hour, but then moving throughout the year. So if I zoom out a little bit here, you can see here are the analemma curves for the entire year. And I'll move my hour a little bit earlier in the day. And let's take a look at, at 10 a.m. If I were to move my month, increasing the month, you'll see that it, the sun position follows that analemma. And the shadow changes accordingly. So those are the analemmas. And showing the compass will just show the compass rows uh, at the base of the sun path. So I'll go ahead and turn the annual sun path arcs back on. And you'll see that there are a few outputs for the sun path. So we have the ability to quantify the solar vector for the sun at a given position. We have the ability also to indicate what the azimuth is for the sun at that position. So you can see here that the azimuth is 148.8. And we can also show what the altitude is. Now let's look at how to not only visualize one shadow at a specific point in time, but we'll take a look at a range of shadows over the course of a day. So to do that, we actually just need to plug in more than one number for the hour value in the sun path component. We have one number 10, and if I move it around, you'll see that the sun changes according to the hour. But in order to simultaneously represent two shadows at once, two or more shadows at once, we'll just have to plug in more values for this hour input. So to do that, to demonstrate just a simple way of doing it with two times, I'll go ahead and just put a panel onto the canvas. And I want this panel to have a list of multiple values. So I'll right click on it and select multi-line data. That way I can have more than one value within this list. So I can indicate 9 a.m. and 16 or 4 p.m. And I'll plug that into the hour input in the sun path component. So you see that I now have two shadows simultaneously being represented within the Rhino viewport. But if I want to show more than two shadows within my viewport, I'll have to introduce either a full list manually inputting the different times that I want to indicate for the shadows every, every hour that I want to show, or I can plug in a series which will automatically create multiple hours at a specific time step, whether I want it every two hours, every half hour, or so forth, and visualize the shadows that way. So to do that, I will put a series component onto the canvas. And the first input for the series is the first number of the series. What do I want to start the number at? So I'll go ahead and plug in a panel here and I'll make that number nine, like I started with before. And I'll plug that into the starting point. And then the next input is the step. So the step size for each successive number. I'll go ahead and keep that at one. So I want, it, uh, I want a shadow for every hour. And then the count is the number of values in that series. So by default, it's 10. And I think I'll need a, f a, a bit fewer numbers here, so I'll, I'll make it eight to uh, go up to 16. And so if I plug this output into a panel, you'll see that now I have a list of values from nine to 16. So from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And if I disconnect this original panel and I plug in my series into the hour component, you'll see that I get not only the first and last hours that I had originally modeled using the multi-line panel, but, but now I get multiple shadows for every hour within that series. So at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and so forth, I get 
the shadows cast for those specific times. And you'll also notice that I have a previewed sun diagram and, so and solar vector for those individual hours. Now let's see, if, if I want to, let's say, change the, the start point of my shadow ranges, looks like I might want to start it at, at 8 a.m. instead of 9 a.m. and I can change the count to 9 so that it goes all the way from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. So it's sort of more of a balanced visualization of those ranges. You'll see that I can now preview in my Rhino viewport um, these ranges of shadows. And by scrolling through the different months in the SunPath component, I can see how those shadow ranges for that range of time will change depending on the time of the year, the month of the year. So this is in March, less pronounced shadows, and then when the sun moves higher up in the sky in the spring and in the summer, you see that the shadow ranges are having less of an impact behind the building when compared to the lower angle of the sun in the winter. So going back again to November and December. We can also play around with the time step. And instead of the, using the default step as one, I can put a panel in here and make the time step two. So I can go ahead and plug that into the number input. And now you see instead of a shadow cast for every hour of the year, I have a shadow cast for every two hours of the year. And we could also make the time step finer and set it to 0.5, and you'll see that now we have shadow ranges for every half hour. But of course, since our series has only a count of nine, I'm gonna to have to increase this to 18 in order to get um, a full range of shadows for the year. Let's see, I'll make it 17. There we go. So instead of ending at 4.30, we're ending at 4 o'clock. And since we have 17 different sun uh, positions previewed within the sun, the sun path component, we also have um, 17 different shadows cast on the ground. And it gives us a, a kind of finer grain of shadows in, uh, previewed within the Rhino viewport. I'll go ahead and set this back to 1 and set this number back to 9. Now we can also use the SunPath tool to understand the implications of, of location on our geometry. So I'll go ahead and set my month back to the number that we started with. So we'll use February 21st. I think we did that for our visualization. So I'll go ahead and set that back to that value. And you see that if I change the climate file, if I change my climate to Anchorage, Alaska, you see where the that's a particular location where the sun is typically low in the sky. It has a huge impact on the shadow ranges for this particular month. But if I change it to Phoenix, Arizona, where that's a, a lower latitude and the sun is typically higher in the sky, there's a little bit less of an influence for this particular range of shadows um, horizontally on this site. And I'll set it back to Boston. All right, that wraps things up for this tutorial on the SunPath diagram and shadow ranges. Thanks a lot for listening, and stay tuned for our next tutorial.